Hi Mark, welcome to another Business Filters. So we are on episode 23. Um, we always kind of say it is an interesting one when people are kind of talking about the podcast now, how do we market, what do we do, how do we sell? And I thought it'd be a really great topic to start talking about how do we market to certain generations? So you've got your generation X and Y, millennials, and we're all a little bit different. And you're obviously a marketing specialist, you're right in and immersed in this, so yeah. you want to kick us off? It's absolutely, yeah, it's a good topic again, John. Um, it's something that we are immersed in, um, and it's something that I think a lot of people don't talk about. Um, a lot of marketing companies will probably just com- create a message and then all of a sudden just hit it out to absolutely every single bit of o- audience out there, um, and that's not the right thing to do, because within these different generations be it generation x well baby boomers before that if you remember the baby boomers generation x baby boomers a eh, generation z and and millennials but i've got a kind of good story about it and it was it, i'd actually wrote a blog probably about three four years about it because it it just something that kind of triggered on me and i thought that that's quite interesting so i one of the staff members had a, like a computer and I, on the computer, it was all sort of lit up. You know, it's just the lit up keys. Oh. And I was like, oh, wow. That looks like, like a Knight Rider computer. So you know Knight Rider, where oh, you know, Michael, David, Knight. Michael Knight, David Hasselhoff, yeah, yeah. Kip. They were just like, what? No clue. Absolutely no clue who Knight Rider was. Absolutely no clue. So they were like, you know, late millennials, Generation Z. Just totally like, no, no, no idea about it at all. And I was like... Imagine you were like just even talking about that, putting that in your message. It just goes over people's head because they just lived in a in a different generation, and that is, you know, there's there's commonalities across all sorts of uh, generations. So, for instance, um, if you were to market to like a baby boomer, because they were grown up with paper and pen, um, and speaking to people face to face, that's what they are comfortable doing. So when it comes to like a digital marketing world, they're not really that comfortable with, you know, marketing to them in a mobile phone. But then you take a Generation X, for instance, and Generation X is everything's mobile. They're probably less even laptop, you know. Oh, I suppose that's actually something of our generation, isn't it? Yeah. So I, I use a laptop nearly every day, use a PC, use a Mac, whatever it happens to be. And obviously I use mobile phones as well, but to me the phone is secondary. Whereas, as you say, it's native yeah. to them. It's, it's native. Like kinda, it's, it's, I, I don't even know if they'll buy like laptops. They're just like, well, why would I do that? I can, you know, you were talking about one of the other podcasts with your daughter. Yeah. Now you just edit it on your phone, and I'm like, what? Uh, <laughs> like, how's that work? You know? Yeah, I mean, again, it ha- happened last night. Um, I was doing something kind of funny on WhatsApp to like one of my friends, and she's like, oh, give me it over. And she, it was just to put kind of look. I says, can I do this like the video with just the love hearts? Now, what I would have done. Is it a, you know, pulled it into the laptop and then just designed it up on the laptop? She said, oh, no, no, we can just do it in an app. She does it in the app for me and puts it on and just puts a little bit of music and you're like, it's amazing. A, it's amazing. But, I mean, that's me and the, like, I'm in a digital world. You know, how far have they came along? Uh, imagine how that feels to a non digital person. And it's like kind of colour television yeah, or something like, yeah, wait, what? Yeah. <laughs> you can do video edit on your phone. I mean, my, my mother in law. Um, who's always like good at giving comments on this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> the like podcast. Clean your Walmart. Clean, clean your Walmart. Walmart. <laughs> and get some flowers at the background. Just for the record, that's not actually Mark the wall. The wall's like that already. <laughs> we will fix it in a future episode. Sorry. But she um, she doesn't have a smartphone. She has like the old old brick phones, you know, because she's just yeah. like. A I don't know how to text. You can edit TikTok on that. <laughs> well, she, just, she doesn't. She doesn't even know how to text. She just uses it to phone, and you're like just. Send me a text, like just to say, yeah, everything's okay, or whatever. You don't need to give me a phone, like, and it's just again different, different ways people communicate. So, it's important as a marketer and even as a salesperson, um, in business, if you're trying to communicate with the different generations, then you need to sort of make sure that you create your collateral. You may need to make sure that you speak to them in a, that different way. So, if you are trying to sell to a generation Z. They probably won't like you phoning them. Yeah, of course. They probably won't. But oh, my mobile phone's going. But if you do it to like a you know baby boomer generation X, you know so baby boomers like obviously the, the obviously the whole kind of story from the war, 
and it was like you know we're after it boom back after it boom back there's lots so of the babies COVID babies yeah it was probably covid baby it'll be the baby boomers minute. too yeah but i think <laughs> that, that you might be right because that'll be the one after generation z or something like that won't it so yeah, they always got their, yeah, they're running out of letters <laughs> i know <laughs> i know generation a it's or just 2.0 two 2.0 <laughs> but um yeah, I've lost my I lost my kind of train of thought there. Are you were talking there about the um, oh this yeah so the yeah, different generations gener- market, yeah so basically so the baby boomers they're about nineteen forty five or something like that to nineteen fifty five then you've got generation uh, X so generation X is like your kind of nineteen you might be your mum and dad right up to like you know people are probably in their forty five ish you know age but these people are generally used to. You know, if you gave them a phone call, they would actually pick up the phone and speak to you. Yep. And they would be very, very natural speaking to you. So for us, you know, doing business or somebody's doing cold calling or, or, or wanting to, to follow up, when you're phoning up and speaking to the people, and that's where us in the business world, that's generally where we are at that age and probably, you know, early millennials. Mm. We are all used to used to kind of speaking to the people. Um, but when you you need to think when you start going down to the kind of late millennials, they'll not want they'll probably be like why is he why is he not? I've, def- I've definitely noticed that with my own sort of phone calls. So when I'm talking to people, they don't necessarily pick up the phone. Yeah. And I've I've kind of observed a, a habit like in the wild, if you will. Yeah. So it's like an unknown number comes up, and they actually like swipe it to the voicemail, yeah. and then they Google the number, and I'm like that's a really interesting sort of like micro action of like right this is what's yeah. happening so then it makes you think what if your number's not on your website so yep. let's say for example you phone uh, Hybrid Anchor or Market Mavens you probably got your business number that when you phone out it might be your mobile yep. but is that mobile mapped to anything that would say oh that was Mark for Market Mavens so yeah. they go oh I take his call yeah but if it comes up and it goes oh I don't know the number it's like oh it could be anybody yeah and you're like well, why don't you just call them back and they're going no no I wouldn't call them back and you're thinking <laughs> but that could be business that, that, you know what people don't generally phone you unless it's like uh-huh. you know they want you for something you get it I won't, I'm not going to phone back unless they leave a voicemail you're like what would get what if it's somebody calling you remember even like phone boxes or something like that what if it's somebody calling for a phone? Uh, your 10 pens in the States <laughs> <laughs> like phone in an emergency I was going to talk about that like, see in regards to micro trends how much of your time would you say you're studying like kind of like the upcoming generations how they're using tech uh, um I, it's definitely we're we definitely look at it quite a lot. No, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say like maybe say like ten percent of our kind of time, but um, it is important to look at because if I want to have a marketing agency, it's going to go for a long time. I need to actually be thinking about you know marketing to these people as well. We do have some clients that are marketing to a younger generation. Um, you know, I had one of the clients that wanted to do some marketing on Snapchat because yeah. it, it was aiming at aiming at the younger kind of demographic because it is one of the things that say I think somebody done a survey and then they were talking about all the kind of Facebook users there were so many Facebook users like everybody had a Facebook and but they were then looking at the use of Facebook so a lot of the younger generation have a Facebook but they don't use it and they, then they asked them the questions so they said well why have you got it and you don't use it because my mum and dad's on it yeah, it's got that kind of family so, connection. Like, uh-huh. So they don't want... And they Facebook's don't want the interesting one where it can be all ages right up to grandparents yeah. will be on it because they associate it now with, like, well, that's where you see the family pictures. Yeah. And, but yeah. what if I... If, so I have to think about... If I was building an audience on Facebook Ads Manager and I go, oh, great, we've actually... I can see an audience manager. We have all these thousands of people that we can actually market to. But are they, act- and although they've got a Facebook account, are they actually active users on the Facebook account? Very good point. You know, so they, like these are the things that you I Just have- because they're there and they're registered. Like, yeah. I think a lot of people don't really look at that. Like I've, I've been doing a few kind of consultancy gigs in the software space. I mean, you're kind of talking to them like, oh, we've got X amount of users. So let's just say they've got like 70,000 users. And you're like, awesome. But that's kind of like turnover. So turnover is not actually the number I want. It's the net profit mm-hmm. or like what the operational profit is. So when you're looking at the kind of numbers, it's like, well, how many are active? So let's just say we've got 10,000 um, YouTube followers, like mm-hmm. subscribers, but how many actually comment and engage yeah. and share the posts and yeah. get, you know, they suggest topics Yeah. because the true measurement is their engagement, I guess. Otherwise it's like, well, well, it depends if you're doing brand awareness, I guess it's the eyeballs are the important yeah. part. But for most kind of campaigns, you would think, I want to put something in front of potentially a buyer, 
that would be in that kind of market like when you bought your Tesla for example yeah. that being marketed to you just at the right time with the right kind of deal you may have said right yeah I'm in that, that's convinced me I want to get mm. one of them whereas if you marketed that to let's say someone else that's just got a brand new car that's like a diesel you know it's not mm. it's not yeah. the right kind of time for them yeah and it is, it's funny that thing because it's like when I, I bought my Tesla as well it's like as I say the in-laws they were like oh why are you getting that and that's not going to be reliable because it's just set in their head because they're, well, like, they're counting their chickens now <laughs> <laughs> the diesel place is sky high you know what it was it was um it was so funny because um that I actually end up because it's a brand new car now you have this issue with brand new cars like in any any sort of car but I was driving down and I had an issue basically with the electric car and it was like the earth wire on the charging port broke so I was in the mo- motorway, just came off the motorway, and then it just stopped dead. And I was there for like all, all day, you know, trying to get it kind of eh, picked up and moved. And they were like that, oh, they were right in there. <laughs> told you so, <laughs> told you it wasn't going to work, no, no, told you no. it wasn't going to work. But see, since that, it's been totally reliable. It's just obviously, you know, somebody probably fixing the car, because I got the car at 30 miles. So there's going to be something, a wee tweak, a wee snag, you know, and it was just a snag that needed fixed. Speaking about the generational thing, so before we move off that story, um, Mark was kind of explaining this story to me, and he says the guy that came out to kind of like repair it potentially. <laughs> uh, so like we're talking about a generational thing and expectations. So whereas the engine in most cars, it's under the hood. So he pops the bonnet, pops the hood. There's no engine there. <laughs> How does this car work? It's magic. Um, not realizing that it's like pistons that are on the wheels. Um, but I think again another example of yeah. a generational assumption. That this is how it's always worked. That to me, that it's a big fear of mine in the sense of I think you could easily lose touch of this industry if you even just disconnected. Yeah. Let's say you were out of this for six months, things can change the massively. Rapid, like, rapid thing, you know, yeah. when responsive web design first came in, yeah. huge, profound impact on the industry. Um, COVID, another one, mm-hmm. massive, profound impact on lots of industries. What do you think the, the next kind of trends that are coming up are? Like, how do you think? sort of like generations that are being born today for example how do you foresee them communicating yeah, well, it's a bit of an unfair question but no no there is a, it's a completely i mean they're born into a digital world now um it's something that's new to us like so we weren't born into a digital world like we were you know digital became a thing as we as, as it happened now we're, it probably ha- happened quite early i'm a robot i was plugged in for the start <laughs> <laughs> but they they definitely are um, in this digital world they know everything about it Um, I really think you know going forward it's going to be a bit crazy like they're going to expect like you know artificial intelligence they're going to Mm. expect augmented reality you know they're do you think that's the thing? Do you think VR is the next kind of social mi- wave that we're going Mixed see? reality. Have you seen the mixed reality? So, you so get it's not like hybridisation, like the Google well, Glass s- kind of thing? It's, it's, it's kind of like, have you seen the Microsoft? I think it's called Microsoft Halo. And you put the thing on your head and it's oh, like... It's like the Johnny LaForge thing, isn't it? Like it's like, well, it's, it's crazy. It's like, so basically you put it on your head and then you get Minecraft and Minecraft could, it could just appear here. And then you can actually just kind of play about Minecraft, but you can zoom right in and do all this sort of stuff. It's mad, but it's it's like it's really cool as well for like things in business. So they, they were, I remember seeing a video about it, and it's like somebody's trying to fix a car engine, and then they can put this on and it just goes like that, right? Screw that five times, and and it just connects with everything that you do. So do you think about a training aspect? Oh, of yeah, it? totally. Yeah. It's it's all there. Well, think about when you're trying to fix like a washing machine uh-huh. or something. I mean. First phone call goes to your dad. Uh-huh. He doesn't answer. Right, I guess we're on YouTube. Yeah. But I mean, if that becomes like a right, Bosch has a new um, application, and if you have an Oculus or a mm-hmm. Vive or anything like that, you download the app, you install it, you kind of fix your own sort of stuff. Yeah. It tells you what the parts, the components. So you'd hold it up and see it's got a crack in it. Like yeah. it can maybe see things you can't see. Yeah. It can scan barcodes. I mean, it's it's getting really pretty intelligent yeah. with what you can do even yeah. now. Yeah, and if you think like the genera- the older generations now, if they did that, they'd be like, what? No, I'm not doing uh, that. What's happening now? Like, you know, yeah. It's listening so, to me. It's well, listening somebody, to me. Well, somebody was telling me, one of the clients was telling me, and it's like, he's got a tool that does, like, it's like Internet of Things, so it's basically a sensor. You stick it on like a offshore wind turbine, and it will tell you if it's breaking and stuff. Um, But he's talking about the engineers of old are, are not there yet, or are, 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 are kind of dying off, basically, and retiring and stuff. 
and he's like that. The ones that, that basically put a screwdriver to the rear and then just kind of tapped it against the metal to I see if it was... Happening. To be, it was, it was like, <laughs> is that a thing? <laughs> what craziness is that? Oh, bye, bye, bye. That, that's broke. That's broke. <laughs> that's <laughs> broke. Yeah. I can see that singing off. Like. But, that, but, the, but the... So the A-type engineers have no clue with this like, little bit of a sensor. Uh, see, I think I think that's a dangerous thing, though, as well. And like I've hired uh, young engineers and will remain nameless with who they are, but developers and stuff like that and I find that that's happened as a, a trend within that industry as well. At the olden days, like so an old dude like me would do CSS, HTML, JavaScript and they would just write it raw and you would have maybe use a library yeah. like jQuery or all these kind of things, not to get super technical with it. So when you're working with it, I knew the code. So it's like the matrix, you know, mm-hmm. blonde, brunette, redhead, I knew what the code meant. But what I've kind of noticed is there's now an over-reliance on things like precursors, so like yeah. technology that helps you write the code, yeah. to the point where they could look at the code and then maybe not know what's happening, like, yeah. oh, this isn't working. And you're like, where I kind of notice that breaks down is older technologies. Yeah. So I had a front-end developer that was trying to work out why they couldn't use um, progressive CSS yeah. in an email. And yeah. I was like, well, he- emails are like 25, 30-year-old tech. Yeah. CSS, you know, at that time three, is just out. Yeah. <laughs> like it, it doesn't know what it, curve it, corners and stuff uh-huh. are. Like you're trying to use like, see if you want to put a shadow on it, you need to kind of use like a PNG image or mm-hmm. of a shadow or yeah. do it another way. But you notice that the the age of the person or like their exposure to how it was, that I suppose it gives us a kind of second but but at base because it's getting increasingly hard for guys like us to keep up uh-huh. with that. You know, increasingly so. The more you're off the tools, the more you're going to lose. Because because what I was going to say there, um, and you made a really good point, is the marketed technology has grown massively, right? So now that you, you a brilliant point. So I used to create email on HTML, you know, from from raw HTML designing it all up, right? Now you can just get a Mailchimp or something like that. Drag and drop. Drag and drop, <laughs> right? But this is happening in every like it's not just like graphic design, right. website design. All of it is really, really easy. So now people are actually like getting really comfortable with these types of tools. What happens if they pull these tools away? They, they, they won't actually have the skills. They won't actually have the raw skills to do it. I saw people I, like you and me blow our nails and go, ah, that's good. I, 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 just I, I, came I, back towards me again. <laughs> good, good stuff. You become so reliant on a, t- on a tool and you become so reliant on a, like to do your job. And that's going to be the thing. It's like that will be the tools of the future. It's like, oh, I don't have a scru- screwdriver, mate. I don't, have, I don't have a screwdriver. I, I can't do the job. You know, it's like that. That's where they're going to go. I, you know, I don't have Mailchimp. I can't. I can't. I can't do the emails. Uh, that's, that's how you send emails. Aye. What do you mean? About, yeah, there's other ways to do it. You know, you do it with Pop Three. What? Uh, but um, and and I think that's it's a dangerous thing. You know, you because you become ro- so reliant on probably corporate companies now with digital disruption because. All of these meal chimps, all of these like smaller companies will get bought up by a bigger, larger company, and it's a bigger, larger corporate company, you know, that is just going to kind of own all the, all the you know technology and stuff like that as well. So, and these people will just be kind of, you know, relying exactly what they're doing. I know how it's working. I think it's quite good to have that kind of deeper knowledge, but things like go out of fashion so fast as well. I mean, yeah. there's, there's loads of what I would class as dead brain cells now. You know, I like learned director. Like which was the precursor to Flash, and even Flash is dead. Yeah. Never mind director. And I, I remember the guy like he was sitting down interview and he scored it out. He scored it out. And he was like, "That's nonsense. Nobody uses that." And I was like, "Thanks." <laughs> I was like, <laughs> "I've just studied that for two years, and I, I've got the joys of like a creative director just like scoring it out as if like, how dare you write? You can speak French." <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, sorry, sorry about that." Like, yeah. no, French real- is not a business language. I, I, was like, I didn't, didn't realise it was offensive to put it on my CV. I thought you would have just said, "We don't use that here." Yeah. Um, but I think it is that way. And even we build on websites, people say like, "What do you build on?" And I go, "Ah, we build on WordPress." And literally the next question is, "What builder do you use?" Mm-hmm. So like they're automatically assuming it's built that way now yeah. because that's became the expectation the, the, of yeah. those generations that have came up behind us. Exactly. I I think as well you're going to kind of touch on ways that you can probably market to people, and be a little bit clever. So obviously like QR codes has became you know came back into the world again um, because of what's happened with like COVID and obviously having to like oh, you're tracking trees, you know, track and trace. scanning for restaurants and stuff. But like a, an older generation is very much like give me something that I can hold, you know, a bit of paper, you know, hard copy, you know, a clever way to do it. And I think you you'd done this before 
I mean, you moved into your new office, it's just like, get a hard copy flyer and a QR code on it. Yep. And and that probably gets the, the generation, you know, the millennials and generations there, because, oh, cool, QR code, I can click that and go into a website and do something cool. But then it also gives some, you know, somebody the older generation a hard like copy. Like physical. They physical, and, that, and the, the message on it as well. So I think as marketers, that's what you need to do, is like try and integrate, you know, because you don't want to be, you can probably create a piece of copy, you know, directly for, you know, one target audience, you know, and then try and do it for another target audience. But if you want to try and be clever and obviously try and streamline things a little bit, then there are some of the ideas that you... I want to mix and blend can, kind of thing. Like, yeah. I hadn't really thought about it until we took the office quite recently. But in the last, say, I don't know, maybe even the last couple of weeks, I've been asked seven times for a business card. Yeah. And I had the embarrassment of having to hand somebody a letterhead as a business card. And that's just a total disgrace. You know, my how they might have fallen. <laughs> but, um, but I was talking to the printer that I use for producing the cards, and he says, I love it, love it, great design, that's going to look really swish. One thing I don't like about it, and I'm like, oh, what's he going to say? And then he says, I would change the URL to a dynamic QR code. And I was thinking, interesting, because in the past I have the pushback against that, going, QR codes are old school, yeah. nobody likes them. Uh, but as you say, like, now we have a dynamic QR code, you know, you can change the URL, so you can have it and say, right, I'll put it to a website video or I'll put it to mm-hmm. the podcast, I'll put it to, I'm doing a public talk or I want people to attend a workshop. Mm-hmm. So it allows you to almost change it, kind of similar to the way Instagram works, you know, mm-hmm. that way you only get one link. Yeah. So that's kind of the way I'm viewing those QR codes and you can totally do that. You can put like a different dynamic QR code in the back of your brochure, different one in the back of your business card and then you can actually run campaigns. Mm-hmm. So you're taking that like print medium that classically didn't have any tracking on it and all of a sudden well what happens when it goes on a mobile phone well we could yeah. fire a pixel off or yeah. a tracker and say actually see that mail campaign you done it was scanned 300 times whereas in the olden days you would have been like right what number did they phone yeah you know it's like because i used to work for the daily record and do the advertising yeah. and the papers and stuff and you would actually be like it's really hard to show somebody something tangible for that yeah. advert whereas if they've done it online you're saying right you got fifty thousand clicks <coughs> Uh, this is the amount of impressions, this is how many people have went through. Now, I don't know what they've done after they go through, but our job's to get you the clicks and the mm-hmm. traffic, and this is what we've done for you. But as soon as you do it in the paper, it's like, well, theoretically, a yeah. paper passes seven sets of hands, yeah, and you're going, I'm sure it does, Bob. And that's the thing with digital, it's all about measurement, you can really measure things, and I think it's a brilliant idea with that QR code, because you can just set up that link with a unique uh, a UTM, a unique parameter, and you can actually see exactly how many people are coming through from that. So if you go to an event today and you hand out your business card to 50 people, you can go home the, the next day and wake up in the morning and go, I wonder how many people actually click, you know, got the link and actually went through to it. You know, and, and then you go like that actually from all the people, every single one of them or, you know, 50% of them or something like that, like, cool. And it, you could probably be very, very clever. You could probably try and capture them with their cookies and see. Aye, <laughs> see it's him. Like, and then it goes through to remarketing, <laughs> and then we've got like you know, on the newsletter, huh? automatic post on Facebook. But you, but you think about it. That's that's marketing in- integration at its best because you go to a, an event with a you know business card, and then you can actually do them as you say remarketing, get them on the website, and that's then bringing in the digital world. It's a clever thing as well because I think see if you put a QR code in the back of something that's kind of. Quirky. I don't know if you remember the IKEA campaign they ran and they had like the mad octopus light mm-hmm. thing, do you remember that? Yeah. So it was in the train stations and everybody's like, what is this? And there was no branding on it. Yeah. And then for ages and ages everybody's talking about it, they're like, what is it? I don't get it. What's the weird octopus thing in Queen Street? And I'm yeah. like, oh, I don't know. And then eventually they kind of lay claim to it and it's like a, ah, okay, right. so that was IKEA. But it's, it was an interesting way of doing it because yeah. it obviously cost a lot of money to push the campaign out. Yeah, and then they weren't actually revealing the brand, and you could totally do that with like something quirky, like a poster or a an actual physical piece of media, and people scan it, and it could almost be like, uh, like I think the movies are quite good at this. Like I try to steal little ideas for like Universal and people like that. So I don't know if you've seen the way the Matrix has been promoted now, the new Matrix film. I, I mean, I've, I've watched the trailer. I don't know. Uh, how it's you, been, you've seen the original yeah. movie, though, yeah. Yeah. So let's see the why like red red pills and blue pills. Mm-hmm. So they set up a website which is like you know what do you want to take the red or the blue pill. So if you want take the red pill, you see a different trailer to something that takes the blue. But actually, they've done like micro trailers. So there's like seven <sighs> variants on each side, and it's like there's little kind of clips because they know the counterculture now is 
people will analyse those videos on YouTube. Yeah. So they're creating the kind of buzz and the mystery, known full well that these analysts on YouTube will push a massive audience segment to the movie. Yeah. Whereas in the past year they just had, there's your trailer, it would have went in the Super Bowl, and that's pretty uh-huh. much all we would have done. Yeah. But they're now talking about these completely immersive experiences. They've done it with Westworld, the TV series. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think a lot of generations are actually missing out on those types of marketing as well. But it's, it's actually quite clever. They've mm-hmm. thought about it not just as a campaign, but like an immersive experience. Yeah. Uh, so if you've got an events company or something, you know these kind of ideas. You're like, wow. Yeah. You know, like I, I would it's, seriously look at some of the big blockbusters. They're doing some pretty yeah. clever. It's stuff. quite a good idea because it's a bit like personalization, isn't it? You're ha- you're personalizing your own experience. Can go, I can pick this one or I'll pick that one, and we do uh, that. But then it's like you assume, like just by default, that I, I, I did you watch both trailers? And you're like, well, who's to say there's two? <laughs> you know, and know. it's like, ah, okay, oh, wait a minute. Oh, is there more than two? And you say, well, actually, there's seven and seven. But then who's to say they don't add other ones I in don't. or change it or they catch you with retargeting or, yeah. you know, they'd use different things. Yeah. Um, but they've done things like that. Even with the trailer, when someone thing that was quite interesting is they took the time snippet. So it says it's now four o'clock or it's now three minutes past four. Mm-hmm. But is it? Is that really the time? Or is it, and it like pure draws you in. You're thinking, but that was in the video. That was in the video, and I thought so. They've digitally captured that, uh-huh. created it, and then on the fly cut the video out. So yeah. when you're watching it, you see a unique experience just for you. Yeah. And it's like, as you say, it's personalization. But yeah. I think that's one of the most clever I've seen recently for yeah. pulling in that kind of YouTube culture. Yep. to kind of like stimulate the kind of promotion. Yeah. Have you seen any other ones? Like you're talking about QR codes, that's kind of like using the whole YouTube yeah. kind of movement. I was going to kind of come up with um, one of the QR codes. I'm not sure if you ever, you, you need to watch it in YouTube to be honest. It's a good YouTube video. It was like Tesco going into South Korea. And um, basically the, there's, there wasn't a, enough places to basically buy up like lots of shops. So they wanted, their goal was like to try and become like one of the top, you know, shops in South Korea. And all like that, but we can't build. We can't build anywhere, um, because the main place was the main shop had all already been there. So they were like, "How do we, how do we get around this?" So basically, they've created the shops inside the subway, and they basically have like a picture of all the products, and they've got QR codes at the bottom of the products. So pe- when people are sitting there at the subway, they go, "All right, I'll get my." Carrots, my, bread, milk, my, carrots, my so. bread, milk, and they be put out, and then by the time that they go home, it's gets delivered to them, and by doing that, they became the second biggest. So they're called like Tesco Home, they're not called Tesco, but called Home Plus or something. Changed their name, became the second biggest in South Korea by doing that. <laughs> watching you, awesome. watching YouTube, it's like an amazing case study of of the power of QR codes. Absolutely amazing. Need to check out. What agency was it done that? Is it? No, it was a, it was a company. I don't I mean I don't know. Internal, the, maybe uh, their own team. Yeah. Because they were just like, how do we, how do we actually sell products to them, um, in a different sort of way without actually having to b- build it? But if you think about, it, obviously the savings in that as well. Oh, it's huge. We well, don't no, have the no staff, no staff, no staff. staff it's it's like just the, the thing of nightmares for people looking yeah. for jobs, but <laughs> for the for the future of kind of. But I think to be honest with you, that's the way the world's going. Mm-hmm. The uh, like I had my first paperless experience in a restaurant the other day. I went to Soba down at the Merchant City and mm-hmm. the Merchant Square. And it was like you scanned the menu in the middle of the table and d- ordered everything digitally. So it was like doing just eat, but you were sitting like yeah. in a restaurant and you're thinking, it's a bit surreal. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of like, so we're still sitting like this, but we're ordering our food oh, digitally as if it's like a just eat order. I'm I like, know. this kind of feels like a weird blend of, you know, it's kind of <laughs> just eat went crazy <laughs> and it's now in this kind of environment. It's like people are just trying to, I think businesses are trying it to save them money. Well. Think about the menus as well. Yeah. Like having to print all those menus, yeah. they get damaged, you know, my kids draw them with crayons. Or, yeah. so it's that, you, that type of thing. You, you can know? update it really, really quickly, you know, as you, you say, like you can just, you know, oh, here's the change, specials, you know? I'm going to change something in the menu, you don't need to print it out. Well, it's, well, well think about that tried and true. Like, so what does every restaurant have to do? What's your special today? Yeah. What's the soup of the day? Yeah. And they have to ask, and like the waiter probably isn't overly bothered. It's part yeah. of the job, but it is annoying because you're kind of thinking that's not a good system for that. Yeah. You know, but printing it's quite destructive as well. You know, just keep printing new menus all the time. Yeah. Cool. So we wrap up today. Then, what do you think your your business belter is? So business belter has been an interesting episode. Actually, just kind of thinking about it, like. For me, I would say try and keep a trend on what the kind of generations that are coming up are really focusing on. 
Uh, Gary V said something in one of his videos. It sounded a wee bit kind of stalkery, but it was quite funny. He was talking about at airports he watches kids like actually playing with their phones because if you look at how they interact, it tells you a lot about what those generations have got there as an expectation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a really clever way of doing that. So next time you're sitting in like a subway or you're observing people, like people watching, mm -hmm. actually observe the way they interact with apps or in business situations, like what kind of tools are defaulting to, how they're expecting them, and constantly ask yourself, are we on these channels? Mm -hmm. Are we actually looking at yeah. where our demographic is? Yeah. Because it will surprise you how much that changes. Absolutely. That would be my belter for the day. Yeah. What about you? My business belter would be make sure that when you're starting a campaign or a marketing that you're always planning at the start. So you have to really understand your target audience and that's when you come and talk about demographics and the age group. I think a lot of people miss this out and not understanding. And then when you do that, that's when you can have that clever integrated marketing where if you have an older generation and some younger generation, that you've got kind of two separate messages. I've seen it an absolutely amazing uh, TV advert when it was about Argos. They had the same, basically, marketing to two different generations with different messages, and it was just really, really, really clever. Um, so trying to do things like that and integrate it and be clever with your message, as I said, with the QR codes on a, on a flyer uh, is a good way to do it. So that would be my business belter. So I'll wrap it up today. Um, it's thank you very much for um, tuning in. If you've got any uh, good ideas or any good sort of tips of you know when you've been marketing to d different generations, it'd be good to kind of hear from them. Like we've obviously came up with some you know different ideas there. If you've done something different, it would be good to share share with the the business builders community. You probably see as well we've got a nice new business builder merch on and a nice new business builders cups so if you want to drop us a little note on that as well if you like them give them as a give us a thumbs up um so it's a good bye from me it's a good bye for him thank you very much see you guys